I want to welcome everyone back to the Pete Quinones show. Thomas is here and uh, going to wrap up the uh, Road Army Fraction, huh? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. All right. Well, uh, where, where are we going with this? I, mean, I wanted to drop a little bit of biographical information about Horst to Mahler because I think he's kind of the key to understanding not just kind of like the post-war ideological culture in divided Germany, but he's sort of the key to understanding the German right as it exists today. And um, I, I, I'm very, I, I support Alternative for Deutschland entirely. I think they're doing great things. I'm not like putting shade on them. But the fact is, uh, if they continue to gain ground, they're just gonna they're just gonna be banned. Okay, like any any truly like right wing tendency in the Bundesrepublik just just gets unceremoniously banned. Okay, so considering that there was there there's a radicalism just kind of intrinsic to any to any kind of like right wing tendency, you know, during the Cold War as well as today. But during the Cold War, you know, whether you were on the right or the left, there was there was there were situations in places like Italy and to a lesser degree in France where like a true like hard right was tolerated. Um, some of that owed uh, Operation Gladio type um, intrigues, which is a whole like other topic that you know we could devote three episodes to. Part of that owed to the fact that some of these EU states what became EU states, what, I mean, then it was just, you know, the, the EC adjacent countries, you know, they had to tread somewhat lightly. Like you didn't want to come down too hard on anti-communist elements, you know, lest you, lest you kind of offer the appearance of ingress of, of, of enemy dialectics in the, in the, in the political discussion. Um, West Germany was a, it was in a strange position. You know, like we talked in the first episode, I think, about why um, Andres Bader, especially, um, but uh, Ulrike Meinhof and, um, and some of the other kind of core personalities of the first uh, Rote Army fraction were so fixated on Vietnam. Like, it's not just because this was the this was the television era when you know and for the first time the civilized world was was truly kind of plugged into to like a common visual experience but the Bundesrepublik, republic it, it really was this like occupied you know client state of america in a way that no other country was like not even japan was owing to the kind of the the cultural barriers there so you know, and when you consider too that the Bundesrepublik was literally like the front line of the Cold War, and it was clear that they were basically going to absorb the the brunt of of Warsaw Pact assault, including nuclear weapons. You know, if and when war came, and in those days it, it seemed very probable that war would arrive. Like this is why I think this is why like Vietnam was so much on their mind. Okay, like they weren't. They weren't just being like virtue signaling fools or something, or they weren't just trying to score points with, you know, kind of the um, the international peace movement. Like they weren't on that tip at all. Like especially the the Rote Army fraction types, they, they they had almost like Sorelian sort of enthusiasm for violence. Okay, so that's important to understand. Um, and secondly. You know, I I'm not saying this to repeat myself for its own sake, but the degree to which um, any sort of radical or revolutionary or, or dynamic tendency, especially um, you know, in in among young people and in youth cultures, you know, th things like that, tendencies like that, they're always kind of confined to uh the zeitgeist okay and, and the spirit of the age all right so it wasn't just that it wasn't it wasn't even that people you know um i mean academic types would think this way but it's not like it's not like guys and 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 girls like prone to prone to radical direct action it's not even like they were thinking like oh you know 
national socialism and fascism was a disaster and it's evil. So we we we've got some moral obligation to kind of take up the red banner. Yeah, there were some people who thought that way, but by and large, the only really conceivable modality of revolt or revolutionary activity was either you know Marxist Leninist or, or adjacent to that. You know, like the degree to which uh uh an, uh you know an above board if you know very um much outside the law you know guerrilla tendency like it, it wasn't really conceivable for a, a such a tendency on the right to emerge okay it just wasn't you know i can't emphasize that enough you know um i realize i'm i realize i'm very much a hegelian and 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 some people disagree with that but i but you know examples of this phenomenon are legion you know not just in in the buddhist republic of the cold war but obviously that's kind of the most um striking and pure like example of that and i come back to the person that's of course to Mahler again and again not just i think he's an interesting guy but he's kind of like the distilled essence of that tendency it um in Mahler's background, he was older than his comrades. You know, he was born in 1936 um, in Silesia. His father had been a, a dentist um, and, and a dedicated national socialist. He attended uh, the Free University of Berlin, and then he immediately joined a Thuringia Association, which was an old school right wing like student fraternity. You know, this is the kind of fraternity that guys like Colin Brenner joined, okay? You know, um, but then immediately after uh, immediately after graduation, he, um, you know, in, in his grad student, immediately, immediately after taking his, you know, with the equivalent of his undergrad degree, he joined a member, he joined the socialist student body, you know, and he started participating in these protests against, you know, nuclear weapons being based in, in in the Bundes Republic. You know, now this led some people to say, like, oh, he was he was some sort of intelligent spook. I don't think that's the case at all. And there's not really any evidence of that. Like what Mahler was doing was, you know, like I said, it's my belief the guy was always a national socialist. He was looking at like what's possible, you know, within the political culture that he was situated. Okay, and um, everybody, everybody in the on, on the real right wing in in the Bundes Republic, you know, um, whether you're talking about Otto Reimer, or whether you're talking about Hans Rudel, you know, or, or any of these, uh, or any of these guys who constituted the early, you know, like Socialist Reich Party, Socialist Reich Party, which became like the NPD later. Like these guys all favored like a demilitarized Germany for obvious reasons. Okay. You know, not just because that would spare Germany from destruction and event of 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 war of war between the United States and and Warsaw Pact, but also it would liberate the political culture from 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 these confining parameters. You know, um and as I'm sure people know, you know, Stalin, um, the famous Stalin memo, which, you know, the American State Department wouldn't even entertain, you know, Stalin proposed a, a, a totally demilitarized Germany, you know, um, that and, and, and a constitution that that guaranteed, you know, absolute neutrality. But of course, that would have allowed um, if not facilitated, you know, complex interdependence with the Soviet Union, you know, and um, and the position has always been of the American regime that that's got to be prevented at all costs. I mean, look at that that that's what under, that that's in large part what underlies like this this war against Russia with Ukraine as a proxy. I mean, look at look at the the terrorist attack on. And European energy infrastructure and, and you know the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline. Okay, so I don't think I think if one understands kind of the variables and the ideological tendencies that 
you know underlie what one's priorities are if they are a a, 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 a you know either a national socialist or a or a, any kind of right-wing partisan in, in the Bundesrepublik, republic then is now i think Mahler's trajectory is, is that conspiratorial in 1963 Mahler, uh he he took his law degree he set up a legal practice in berlin and is uh his specialty was basically uh industrial and labor law you know um and he was he was very successful at that okay it um and he 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 continued to immerse himself um in kind of student radicalism obviously because he he was older now and a professional man like in sort of like a sponsorship and mentoring capacity you know like he see he began providing like legal advice to a lot of these people um you know providing them funding that, that a lot of them desperately needed because you know these these kinds of ngos i mean not just student organizations but any, any kind of ngos particularly in those days that weren't adjacent um the bond regime were you know were always like start of cash and um and things of this sort i mean that was uh you know this, 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 was, this was a consistent um activity that he was uh that he was immersed in and where we last left off then we we're talking about how um the core of uh of the of the, um, the road army fraction you know they ended up after after uh andreas Bader was sprung from jail you know uh they they ended up um they ended up traveling to the middle east you know through by way of East Berlin and, um, you know, owing to their contact on the ground, Saeed, who'd been, uh, who was the son of a, of a political science professor of some, of some, um, prestige, you know, like I said, like it's never been clear exactly kind of like what Saeed's like resume is, but he, he's been harassed by security forces for decades. I believe he's still alive, but I believe that Horst and Mahler like facilitated these this these sort of contacts okay and in those days um in those days fata was the dominant element of the plo it's an imperfect analogy but the plo is a what i mean this they, they they fought a war with each other about a decade ago but um it was always a tense alliance between um hamas and fata and Fatah traditionally was was a secularist, you know, Marxist Leninist adjacent um non-state actor. It, an imperfect analogy would be what became combined loyalist and military command in Northern Ireland between the UVF and the UDA UFF. Okay. Um but in those days, you know, Fatah was definitely like the dominant element. And um their competitor was the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine, which had been founded by a Greek Orthodox Christian. The PFLP enjoyed a lot of support from the East Bloc, and their tactical and strategic orientation we're both very much oriented towards a, a global a kind of a military politique. What I mean by that is they were very, very active in Africa. They were very, very active in Europe. You know, they were very, very active uh, in Indonesia for a time. You know, they're, they, they said that, you know, we've got a, we, we, we've got to treat this as an international struggle. You know, yeah, so the liberation of Palestine obviously first and foremost is you know it's got to be our the kind of fair punk of our of, of our um of of our military activity but this has to be international in character you know um and uh for those who remember or those who are students of cold war history the bombing of the discotheque in west berlin that you know uh killed three american soldiers and wounded 
a few dozen people, you know, the La Belle discotheque, which was a which was a known hangout for U.S. occupation forces. There's the Popular Front for Liberation at Palestine General Command that pulled that off, you know, very much hand in glove with the Stasi. Okay, but but Fatah PLO, you know, they felt they felt like they they had something to prove in this regard. Okay, they felt comparatively like very provincial. You know, they felt like they were kind of like losing the the propaganda battle in 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 the court of world opinion. Okay. So the guy like and I'm, I'm speculating here, but I think the facts, if one kind of reads between the lines, the man like Horst Mahler, you know, who by this time again he wasn't a kid; he was in his thirties. You know, he was he was a he was a well-off attorney. You know, with a with a law practice in Berlin. Um, I believe he spoke a few languages. You know, him approaching Fata and saying, you know, I have these like young people and they're very much committed to the revolution and you know they they you know they 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 want to learn basically uh they they basically want to learn like guerrilla warfare from you i think that would have been like very appealing to them you know um now this first the first iteration of the road to army fraction like as we've talked about it had many problems um Bader himself andreas Bader, i think was something of a crazy person he was a uh, he was a a thrill seeker he was probably a psychopath you know um gundred enslin i think was actually very committed and um you know men and women are different like we've talked about but female revolutionaries are important they serve an important role and um people shouldn't be down on them because many of them are very 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 committed okay like it's not like women aren't weaker than men like uh i mean physically obviously there's you know a disparity there but i think gudrun enslin especially going to her kind of pietas background was uh was 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 probably kind of like the most stable of of that coterie um Ulrike Minoff um was kind of a it was kind of a cliche, you know, like a uh, middle class lady who, you know, kind of was easily misled, I believe. You know, this was not the best mentioned material around which to build a revolutionary coterie. And later that changed. Later iterations of the Root Army Fraction I, were incredibly effective. And like, as we've talked about, and as we'll talk about some more, I, by that, by the 1980s, um, the third iteration of the RAF had had become very much like an like an implement of the Stasi. Okay, you know they were the kind of ops they were pulling off then was they were, they were trying to murder Alexander Haig and things like this. Okay, like this, you're talking about an entirely different caliber of of people and an entirely an entirely more ambitious operational sensibility. But um, when the Rotomi fraction arrived um, in Jordan, uh, Horst Mahler was already there, um, and their their hosts, uh, um, the the their their PLO hosts, were originally pretty suspicious of them, like not because they thought that they might be ops who were, you know, their um, as double agents or something but they, they just weren't convinced they were serious so initially uh they kind of treated them like they were tourists you know uh it basically you know took them around and, and kind of filled them with with political propaganda about you know israeli atrocities and which, which were true i mean they weren't there you know that this this wasn't being confabulated you know they'd take them to their rifle range and things like this they'd you know, they'd let him sit in on classes about, you know, um, you know, where they they, they where they they they'd study things like, um, you know, Mao's uh, red book and stuff. Um, this soon caused a fair amount of hostility. But when uh, Bader insisted on being treated like any other revolutionary cadre 
um he started uh, he kind of started showing his uh showing his bourgeoisie colors like um he uh he started he re he refused to wear BDUs and caps um you know he'd wear like uh he'd wear like civilian pants like jeans or like the kinds of like velvet trousers that like hipster types like in those days wore like even during like training maneuvers you know so you got this guy like you know wriggling under barbed wire um like on the training ground like uh you know wearing his like designer jeans and stuff um <laughs> the um as i think i mentioned before um the uh the fata had no um they had no problem with uh then they had no problem with like training women to fight you know because they, because they had to you know and um in any revolutionary circumstance that's uh essential anyway but um you know they obviously like sleeping quarters and stuff were segregated as were facilities and um Bader and um Meinhof like refused to accept this you know they presented under the auspices of you know equality between the sexes but you know uh like for context uh a lot of these young uh a lot of these young Arab fighters you know were like little more than kids like they they'd never even seen like a naked woman before you can like imagine like how disruptive this was you know um and this uh almost led to the camp commandant who was an algerian um you know almost the uh, uh, almost um you know like 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 banning them from the from the camp and uh you know putting them on a plane back to back to berlin but Mahler was uh was able to um kind of like finesse things at least in the short term and like apparently one of the uh one of the student types who um in the road army fraction had brought along as a recruit um like uh asked why there was no coca-cola machines like in camp like you know like these were completely completely uh disengaged from reality so this was not i i emphasize this because like this was not like an auspicious start to the road army fraction and um it it's important to consider that because like again a lot of what you'll read particularly in the era i mean for, it really from, really from the 80s from like later cold war when the RAF, when the third iteration of it was still active, like they'll talk about it as if it was this uh, Stasi, um, the kind of squad of of terrorists that, you know, from inception was was a sort of highly effective, you know, cadre element. Like it's not the case at all. It was a very spontaneous development. It, it was very much an organic uh, development. Um, of the uh of the kind of berliner like student culture like the fact that the stasi and in my opinion specifically marcus wolf was able to um was able to uh you know kind of mold it into something highly effective is is a credit to um stasi operational sophistication as well as uh you know the kind of like learning curve um that emerged as uh these kind of asymmetrical conflicts of which you know like vietnam i mean, I mean vietnam was was many things including like a very very much a conventional war but there was also an asymmetrical aspect to it but as these kinds of conflicts you know sort of jumped off in earnest you know people um with partisan leaning it became kind of like more and more habituated to the reality of these things but this this was very early on in that in that kind of conflict cycle um 
you know, in these these Palestinians, I mean, for years, you know, they've been they they've been living on canned meat, you know, like military rations, um, you know, stuff from uh like canned canned goods from United Nations relief organizations. You know, they uh they they, they you know like any like fresh meat was and um and vegetables and fruit was I mean like a you know it was was a luxury to them you know so I mean this this bred <coughs> a fair amount of resentment too and there was a uh there's an anecdote of uh apparently uh Ulrike Meinhof um on uh on the firing range um an instructor uh handed her a, a Soviet grenade which were like um unlike the uh unlike the old Wehrmacht potato masher grenades um they these are the ones uh that uh, they look kind of egg-like you know and uh you don't screw the cap um to free up the ring you know and then like you pull up you'd pull the you'd pull the ring to pull the pin um so apparently instructor showed Ulrike how to like you know unscrew the cap uh, you know to liberate the the ring and then she pulled it and like held it as like the grenade band to hiss and then asked like what do i do now and uh so just kind of, like, throw it throw it <laughs> so he like ran for cover but um you know, this is the kind of stuff uh this is the kind of stuff they were dealing with um the palestinians i mean like uh kind of a kind of a crazy man um and um in the person of of Bader and uh most of the others uh you know a lot of a lot of balls and, and no common sense whatsoever um but uh i do um but it would have what it however what something that did do i think those who Including Andre Bader himself, the experience in Jordan. None of these, uh, none of these people, except uh, um, Ulrike Minoff, had been a little kid during the war years, um, and so had Mahler. Although Mahler was obviously as you know, we just discussed had kind of a more sophisticated sensibility in all kinds of ways, but the rest of them had no experience of war or combat. Um, the uh, and in, in this in this Fedin camp where they were training, um, you know, Isra Israeli bombers were, were regularly circle the sky. Um, Jordanian troops were. Uh, had established the main line of resistance only a few kilometers away from the camp. Um, everybody was issued live ammunition at all times because at any time, you know, and the IDF could assault, you know, so whatever, however, however cringe some of these antics might have been, um, it did, uh, it, it, it did prepare these people for. For real combat situations you know in a way that ordinary training could not um and i think that that is significant too because uh this uh this this this, this training um lark is a lot of court historians write about it if it was just a sort of like fiasco and and, and kind of like comedy of errors but you know I, I disagree man like yeah there was that aspect of it but you know if you situate anybody in a combat zone like that you know uh while they're undergoing an intense kind of regimen of you know it's only just like very basic you know kind of like infantry skills and things and like you know how to read a map and a compass and you know how to keep your clash deck off clean and how to you know how to load it and how to you know use iron sights and things you know that um learning these practical skills when you're quite literally in a combat zone um even if you're not taking hostile fire every day or something it i 
I I think that that I think that that confers a certain um um benefit that that can't easily be quantified by traditional metrics. But uh, the uh, you know in um. Also, too, because Palestine was very much, it wasn't just the front line of uh, of the Arab and Islamic struggle against Israel, but, you know, the, uh, the Algerian war um, was, uh, was still fresh in everybody's mind, and it, it was still underway in some ways. You know the um there was a certain prestige factor to um to making contact uh with uh with the camp commandant and other personages around uh, like abu hassan who uh the palestinians were on very good terms with and you know the fact that um the fact that um, these RAF recruits, and in particular Horace Tamaller, because again, like I said, he was, he was and is basically a political animal, you know, um, this generated enduring um, um, channels of communication, you know, and like I said, I, I, I write a lot about um, Johann von Leers as well as uh some other third right personages like who quite literally during the cold war like joined the arab camp you know von Leers himself he he converted to islam took the name omar amin served in the court of nasser um you know um he viewed islam as as the dialectical antithesis of judaism and thus you know um the perfect uh sort of principle like rallying principle in order to defeat in order to defeat what he perceived as a then triumphant jewish dialectic uh in the zeitgeist okay um i'm not saying that like Mahler was on you know it was 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 thinking these sorts of things like um von leers was but instinctively i I think that he very much was within that, um, you know, in, in, like engaged in that paradigm psychologically. Um, the, uh, but, uh, you know, such that, uh, such that it, uh, one second, let me just pull up my notes here. So I said it was to the uh, really kind of the the zenith of uh, of um of the first uh, of the first iteration of the RAF was the hijacking of Lufthansa Flight One Eighty One. Um. No, this was after this was after most of the key personages of the Rote Army fraction, the Bader Meinhof Federation of it, had either been killed or captured, you know, arrested. The uh the security elements of the of the Bundes Republic had gotten a tremendous um boon um owing to you know the, the, the these terrorist activities that were underway and specifically um you know the the munich situation in 1972 where the the israeli athletes were um were slaughtered but um lufthansa flight 181 on october 13th 
1977. In the summer of 77, um, colloquial, colloquially became known as the German Autumn, owing to the an epidemic of political violence. And this is considered to be, you know, kind of one of the most, um, what, what, one of the, one of the most brazen instances of it, um, for operators from the popular front for liberation of Palestine hijacked Lufthansa flight 181. And, um, their specific objective was to secure the release of the imprisoned Rhodes Army faction. Okay. And again, I to, this is what I was getting at when I was talking about uh, Horst de Mahler and what I believe is his, you know, rather profound ability to index with other revolutionary elements. And like we talked about before, um, the popular front for liberation of Palestine, kind of their whole part of their whole grand strategy was to demonstrate an ability to project power globally, you know, and this this endured uh, until the end of the Cold War. Um, interestingly, the popular front for liberation of Palestine still exists. Um, I don't know to what degree they still abide a Marxist Leninist program. But they fought on the side of Assad against ISIS. Um, and I believe that uh, they're active in um, the Yemen civil war. And um, they uh, there's a militia also under arms in Yemen that calls itself, uh, you know, something like the... the uh, like the armed grouping of South Yemen or something like that. Now, South Yemen was, of course, uh, was a Soviet client state. It no longer exists, but it was the only, it was the only Marxist-Leninist Arab state. So it was kind of like a feather in the cap of Warsaw Pact. But I speculate very strongly that the sudden emergence of these guys, like, fight riding under the banner of South Yemen and clicking up with the PFLP, like that's, they, they are, they are very much in a Russian patronage. I think that should be clear. I find that kind of fascinating, but, um, be as it may, um, the, uh, there's this, uh, there's this spectacular, uh, raid to free the hostages, um, on flight, moved on to flight 181. Um, the plane had ultimately landed in Mogadishu, Somalia, um, and the Somali army, they, uh, they provided a distraction. They detonated this ordinance, um, on the runway in front of the nose of the aircraft. So the hijackers rushed to the front to see what was underway. And then these, these commandos from GSG-9, you know, which is the... Bundeswehr's, uh, like, special operations element, and these British SAS guys, you know, they then, uh, they then blew open, um, the passenger door, um, and, uh, and, um, and, and took out the terrorists. But, um, it, uh, pretty much immediately, um, after, uh, like after the like, like I'm talking like you know days after the uh, the incident, um, the uh, a, a bunch of the imprisoned RAF members uh, died, um, supposedly by suicide, um, including Andres Bader, Gudrun Enslin, John Carl Rasp. And um, Ingrid Moeller, who uh, supposedly attempted suicide but survived her injuries, but um, the belief, the claim of Moeller as well as others was that um, you know these these people were murdered by by the guards, and uh, it was in the immediate uh, 
aftermath, uh, Helmut Schmidt, um, who was the consular uh, of the Buddhist Republic, he uh, he was hailed as a hero in the Western world for you know for his decision to storm the aircraft and refuse to negotiate. Um, and you know he uh, and interestingly, West Germany and Somalia like became very tight after this, like going to their operational integration um, militarily. And um, obviously, like Somalia, you know, having a substantial Muslim population, this was like good PR. But it it, it was believed, again, by people like Horst Mahler and others, like some, some sympathetic to the Roth Army fraction, some not that, you know, um, that, uh, you know, Schmidt's uh, people like had had these Roth Army fraction prisoners murdered as part of their, you know, basically because they're saying like, look, like you're not, no, nobody's going to, nobody's going to hijack our planes and hurt our people like to try and, you know, spring motherfuckers like this. We're just going to, we're just not, we're, we're, we're going to, we're going to kill them. I think that's, and I mean, that's, that kind of thing probably seems like unthinkable today, not because of brutality or something, but well, I mean, within the Cold War, the context of it, I mean, it was um like certain things like certain things were acceptable um that but they just like weren't discussed you know it was, it was kind of like a hush hush wink wink like aspect to it and i think that's i think that's i think that's pretty clearly what happened um that um the uh now What's most, um, give me one second. I think, uh, also too, it's, you know, the, um, something that would, would change too in the later iterations of the butter of, of, the, of the Royal Army fraction. You know, the, uh, first of all, they became very adept at, 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 um, at striking, you know, like prestige targets, you know, like businessmen, industrialists, bank presidents. You know, like I said, what was going to be kind of like the feather in the cap, I, 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 I'm not trying to be crass by, you know, discussing a, an attempted homicide in, in flippant terms, but um, kind of like their big uh, their big coup was going to be you know blowing up uh, General Al Haig when he was Supreme Commander of NATO. It uh, like their operational focus very much shifted towards you know kind of proceeding as the vanguard of an occupied country. And that was very different than what the Bader Meinhof iteration of the Royal Army Fraction was doing. You know, I mean, not only was the initial organization kind of scattershot in their priorities, but they were very much trying to index with, you know, kind of like the global like proletarian revolution um, liberation movement. You know, and like I said, I Horace de Mahler had an outsized impact on uh, their strategic and operational priorities and him kind of viewing Israel as like the primary adversary of a revolutionary German armed grouping made perfect sense. But the fact that later, you know, the legacy, what was the, what, what, was the self identified like legacy organizations or success organizations, you know, their targets became, you know, the economic, like the high financial economic infrastructure, the Bundes Republic and NATO, you know, I mean, and that's very, I think that very much indexes with an understanding of them being, you know, a, a DDR client regime, like the Stasi's notion 
always was, and this was proper if your ambition is to discredit the Bundesrepublik, was to, you know, first, last, and always portray the Bonn regime as this... Uh, is this militaristic, like a uh, American client regime that had no real legitimacy and had no um, real support from the body politic, you know, and that um, in and of it, like, like the, whose existence itself preserved, um, you know, an elevated state of. Uh, arousal for lack of a better term of armed forces in theater because its very existence was dangerously provocative you know um and don't get me wrong like warsaw pag definitely was at war with israel they were literally actively at war with israel but um you know a uh a west german uh non-state actor element that Warsaw Pact uh, was aiding and abetting and, um, you know, providing operational priorities to the way, like, it, it makes perfect sense that, you know, their, 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 their targets would be NATO officers and, um, and, um, and, and key personages and, the West German infrastructure. Um, we can, uh, that's about all I got on like the Bader Meinhof iteration. We can get into the subsequent um, manifestations of this phenomenon if you want to, or if you want to change direction and get into a different topic, we can come back to it. But it's, um, it's like it's a huge topic like the uh i've got uh like i'm powering my way through to refresh my recollection like these two volumes on like the entire history of <laughs> and about like halfway through um but i don't I, I i don't want to spend too much time on one discrete topic though i will if you want to but that's um i think it <clears throat> something we can come back to if we have a uh, a one-off episode we want to do we're already doing that one we're already planning a one-off episode coming up later this week um and then i figure we just probably after that just start on a new topic yeah no and that's great we're, and yeah also as we get into um yeah when it when it's when it's topically appropriate um like to uh get into like evil arch or era cold war i'll come back to it but I don't want people uh i mean people people are free to criticize me like whoever they want like but i mean like i i don't want people thinking like hey what the hell like you didn't you know you're only covering you know like basically like one third of the subject it's like um and it's, it's not because i'm like lacking or because i can only realize that there's like a lot more to cover and also i think for at least for our purposes or for my purposes rather like i said i think the percentage of horse Mahler is very important and He's presented as some kind of crank or some kind of opportunist, or uh, some people accuse him of being, you know, some sort of intelligence agent who, you know, simply took on um, the role of a turncoat because, you know, his uh, his agency's ops became, you know, like neo Nazis in lieu of communists. If the what that's that's complete nonsense. Um, and I don't, I don't see how people made that case considering the man went to prison for like five years, you know, for, um, for a quote unquote Holocaust denial. But yeah, I hope, uh, I hope people, this series has been getting a lot of praise and I'm very like honored and humbled by that. I, I hope people, uh, continue to get a lot out of this, um series but with, with this episode um so i'm very i i'm very fortunate you're willing to invite me on um to cover these topics man and uh i want to i want to thank everybody very much for their for their kind words and constructive feedback of course um yeah, do quick plugs and we'll get out of here <laughs> yes sir
Oh yeah, too. We got we we also got to get back to our mystery science theater three thousand series. Yeah, we'll do we'll do that next week. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, the best place to find like the kind of the one stop uh site for like all my content is my it's just my website. It's thomas seven 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 dot com number seven h m a s seven 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 dot com. You can find everything there. Um, my Substack. That's where I do long form stuff that's where the podcast is at it's real thomas 777.substack.com you can find me on x formerly twitter um at uh real capital r-e-a-l underscore number seven hma 777 um i'm on uh tgram it's uh Mind Phaser is my Tgram. It's named after the pod. But if you just if you just look for Thomas seven 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 on Tgram, like you'll find it. Um, I'm not I'm I I'm I'm active on there every couple of days. I'm not super active because I'm not a big fan of Tgram. Back in the days when I like literally could not like get a social media account without it being nuked in minutes, I relied heavily on it. But I am on there. Um, and yeah, that's I'm on Instagram and yeah, seeking each will find. All right, Thomas. Till the next time. Thank you.